for being here. Okay, so I'm going to start and then we'll take questions, okay? So, first question, because there's actually people in the room here that have never sold anything. They're here because they want to become a reseller. Um, there's a lot of them. So they ask me, like, is this for someone that's never resold anything? So my question is, what would be, like, your top two tips, fundamentally, what you think that they should do to start reselling? And you don't all have to answer that. We can have two of you that will answer that question. Put your hand up, take the mic, let's go. Sure. Cool. Um, and if you've never started, like, and people always said, people said this to me about YouTube, but it's the same. Just start. Like, just everyone's got stuff in their house that you you don't use, you don't need, you don't want anymore. And the thing, the good thing is, when you're selling stuff that's in your house, it's your own stuff. So the chances are, you know what it is, you know what size it is, you know how much you paid initially for it. So. Just get it, photograph it, upload it, and just do it, and then just see what happens. Like, the, that's the best thing. Like, you sell your own stuff first, get some money from selling your own stuff, and then keep it in a pot. And then, if you like reselling and you think you want to like further it, take that money and then go out and start like buying stuff. Get yourself a tenner, go to a car <laughs> or a charity <laughs> shop, and just buy the most random stuff. And when you get that first sale, you're like, yeah, I'm hooked. My first one was a bucket of soldiers from Toy Story. Never look back. Never look back. Just literally, that's it. Yeah, just start with what you like. Sell your own stuff. And because it's your own stuff, you obviously like it. Um, yeah, get, don't even start with that much money. A tenner, what you like, cheap, sell it. Even if you make a loss, you've enjoyed the process, you're learning the process. And get the bill going from there, really. Get it rolling. Also, don't be afraid to tell people, tell your friends, tell your family. You will get bin bags worth of stuff just dropped off at your door. Um, and in those bin bags, there will be a lot of rubbish. Um, but you'll also get some gems and it's free money. Keep your cost of goods as low as possible for as long as possible. And then invest and make that money, make more money for you. Kev, do you want to add to that? Well, I guess I will then, eh? <laughs> um, yeah, just to highlight what they said, really, there's such a low barrier of entry, I'd say, to reselling that you know, anyone can literally do it, and don't be afraid of making mistakes, you know? I think that's, that's something that maybe puts people off, thinking, oh, I'm going to buy this and it won't sell, but I can assure you, probably speak for everybody, you know, make more mistakes than you probably make wins, but it's just about making sure that those wins and what you sell kind of out, outweighs it. And, more experience comes and you learn from that. So yeah, it's just, it's such an easy thing to, to get involved in that if it's something you're thinking about, yeah, I'd say just give it a go, I'd say. Thanks Kev. Can we ask the rag house just to close that door? Can someone ask them, just so we can hear? Get you guys in the back, probably like really struggling. Yeah? Okay, cool. I'll turn the music down, thank you. Right, questions from the room, you can direct, aim. Arby's not answered anything yet, let's put him on the spot. Well, I could answer the one previously as well. Go, go for it. Um, I was actually chatting with a reseller last night, and um, this person just started selling about six weeks ago, and he's, I mean, you know, it's a bit about fake, we, we do vintage wholesale, but he started selling his own stuff, so I think that's like a great low-risk way of starting off. As you said, barriers to entry are so low. You have so many marketplaces out there. Just go start listing on Vinted, Depop, eBay. It literally costs nothing to do so. And once you've gotten the hang of like, you know, what what is selling, start scaling up, right? It's super easy to do. Like, go buy things that you know are trending in the market right now. Right? If you have Carhartt jackets, like, go source a few of those, start selling it, get that money and then reinvest it. And then as you start doing this, guy that I was talking to, um, and he started six weeks ago, and he's like, I've already made about 2,000 pounds in the last six weeks, and I only started off at 200 pounds. So just sort of really reinvesting that and reselling can get you to grow really fast. Thank you so much. Um, Ian, guys, we have masterpieces in the house. If you don't follow his YouTube, let's go. Hey guys, um, I watch all of you on YouTube and follow all of your Instagram. You guys make it look really easy. Um, I haven't found anything for two, three weeks, anything decent. 
how do you guys get motivated whenever you're out there and you're not finding stuff because I'm not motivated at the minute? At the direct debits every month help with the motivation. <laughs> myself, it's my passion, like uh, growing up I didn't really know what my passion was, I thought I want to be a footballer, I want to be a basketball player, went to college, don't enjoy that, been a physio, and then just stumbled upon reselling by accident, uh, shout out to Amy, the wife, who's here today. Legend. <laughs> it's kind of her fault I done it, before when we first met I didn't even step foot in a charity shop, I thought it was uncool, didn't want to be seen dead in one. But um, I forgot the question. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, motivated. So apart from bills, it's just I know I'll only find the cool stuff if I keep looking, keep looking. So not just the charity shops. Okay, I've done that. Vintage. Okay, I've done that. Boots Hour. Done that. Auctions. Just literally only find the cool stuff quite often because I'm non-stop looking in all the different places. And then might be a week or two or a month before you find a banger. But um, when you do find it, that's you know, straight the match and the fire's going again. So it's probably more, most important to keep looking when you are feeling like yourself now. Like, just keep going, you'll find it. Respark the match and go from there. And you're always learning. Like, you could go to a car boot looking for like video games, you'll come back with some baby lotion. Like, it's just how it goes. <laughs> some lean sack kind of shit. You know, I had to drop it in there. Like, just literally, just search everything. If you can't find anything, just go to a store. There might be some curtains on there. You might get lucky. They might be worth 400 quid. Might be worth two pounds. But you'll learn, you build your knowledge, and then after that, you're just always on a treasure hunt for crap. Collecting buttons quickly. Yeah. I think the thrill of the chase is really important. Um, like going to an, going on the online easy live auction house thing, and lazy auctioneers will just do like they'll have a bunch of jackets and they'll call them men's jackets. But if you know the nuances, if you know how things are cut, if you know what buttons are made out of, you might recognise that actually that's a really decent brand and you'll be able to snipe it for a fiver. And I think stuff like that, that keeps me motivated, beating people actually is at their own game. Quite like it. Uh, I think for me, it's not so much about motivation, it's more like basically I, I have... Like, I just have things that I have to do every day, whether I'm motivated or not, I, ha I just <coughs> have to do it. Um, I think the motivation for me is just thinking, like, if I don't get up and do this today, <coughs> make this work today, then I'm going to have to go and get a, a normal job. And that, for me, is just a double life. Um, yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying, because obviously we'll have all gone out say charity shops, I know that's what you do a lot of, that's the easy example because you can spend hours in the town and you find, you know, maybe nothing, one item, you think that three hours spent there, but I think as much as it sounds a bit like a cop out, it's, it's that kind of time I think and, and you learn in that those days are going to happen and not letting them affect you as much, I know it's easier said than done, but obviously when you've been doing it for a longer time, you start to roll with the punches, I suppose. So a, a no sales day or a very low sales day on eBay, when you first start out, it's, it's the end of the world, you know? You're, you're really stressing out, is this gonna work for me? And then after you've done it for a few years, you think, oh, I've got loads of them in Morocco now, you know, that's happened, and you come out the other side. So if you've ever started a job as a part-timer at the same time as a full-timer, because I know obviously you do it part-time alongside a full-time job, which is, you know, a crazy fee in itself, but you kind of find after a few months that full timer just finds things so much easier than you, even though you've, you've been there the same amount of time in calendar days, but obviously they've got more hours put into it, more experience. So, you know, that, that time does, does definitely help, which is why I think for the people starting out, like I say, don't be too scared to make those mistakes, have a few bad days, and they will hopefully get a bit easier as you experience them more. I think I'll answer this in two parts. Um, for me, just to stay motivated in general, it's if you're not doing something you, like if you're doing something you like, it's way easier to stay motivated, right? If you don't like it, nothing you do will keep you motivated in the long run. So I think that's just like around motivation and how I keep myself motivated. Um, now specifically around sourcing, 
right? Now, the reason we started building this is because it's not like sourcing today, and especially speaking about secondhand fashion, it's not easy. Like, it's not repeatable or scalable. Like, today, if you want to build and keep growing this business, like, you will start getting blocked because sourcing is so bad. So what we often speak about is, if we want to make secondhand first choice, you got to first fix sourcing. And I think the way, the reason we're building what we're building today is to help with that, because we have a network of suppliers from around the world who are essentially dealing in these donated items. Right? They're mostly in places like Pakistan, India, where donations end up. Right? And we're helping connect people to that. So let's say if you're looking for a certain certain item, you can just go and post about it, and you'll have folks be like, look, you, we are collecting these items, we can collect it for you. So what we're trying to do is try to make it a bit easier so that you can concentrate on selling those items, not just going around and hunting for it. Even though the pleasure is in the hunt, so you know, sometimes we go against each other a bit. That's, that's my two cents. Thank you so much. So we have a question here. Could you introduce yourself? And then that's the way from. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Gavin. I'm new to this. I'm from Essex. And the question, the question <laughs> I had was, uh, how do you get the knowledge? That seems the most daunting thing to me. How do you know what you're buying? And the, the lady there just said the right buttons or the cut or whatever. Yeah, how do you build that? Is there a quicker way of doing it? When I first started, I used to literally just spend time on eBay all the time. Like, you'd search a brand, go from highest price to low, take hours, but like, you'll see an item and it will just go in your mind. And you'll be out in the car boot and you'll be like, shit, that's an item. And like, it, it just, stays in your mind like you might think i'm not learning anything from this but it all just stays and like also getting on instagram like everyone shares what they've picked up and all that and like i've picked up so much stuff like george's ad stuff and i'm like yeah i've picked that up like it's big money or cheek will have some stuff i don't know anything about clothing but if i see i don't know a barber coat i'm like yeah that's me so it's just like get in get amongst the community like instagram is the main hack just everyone shows what they've got and spend some hours on eBay, searching the prices. Yeah. It definitely comes with, I don't think there's a quick um, fix sort of thing. Like I started with ceramics, like I don't touch them there really, but like NatWest Piggy Banks, then it went to like glassware, then I found out no, that that's not my thing, so then I moved on to vintage retro <coughs> furniture. And then I've got my knowledge from the ceramics, so if I don't find clothing, I don't find trainers, and I find something really good ceramics, like, I don't know, it's this sort of, comes with time, like, yeah, it's sort of chop and change, but then you don't have to chop and change and know everything about everything. So they can just sell clothing 100%, and that's all you need to make a successful business. But yeah, if you're early on, like I'm still different with quite a lot of things, um, yeah, just sort of chop and change, and if something falls off, like, for example, say trainers, like everyone's selling trainers, that's when I dip away and then find a new niche. So electronics, maybe. So, yeah, it just comes, it comes with time, but there is cheat codes like YouTube channels, like yeah, Instagram. Yeah, um, just find something you like, just find everything you know, or find out everything you can find out about that niche. And then once that's in there, go on to something else. And then, yeah, it's not really a cheat code, but it's a lot easier now with YouTube channels and that. This sticks. <laughs> So, a quick hack to try to figure out what's selling. Now again, I'm, I'm coming from a clothing background, so I can speak for that, can't really speak for other stuff, is go on other marketplaces. Go on Depop, go on Vinted, go on eBay. You'll see, like, all of these marketplaces have ridiculous amount of data. I'm saying that because we have data as well, right, on what's selling. And as a marketplace, their primary objective is to increase their own sales on the platform and their seller's sales. So what they do is right on top, you'll see the trending items, you'll see picks, you'll see best selling. So in any given marketplace, if you go on top and you see the items that they have put, that they have curated up there, you know that those are their high selling items. Right? So if you go on to eBay, you'll see sports cards that's right up there. Right? You go on to Depop, you'll see like you know staff picks around like you know Y2K, you'll see Carhartt, you'll see all of these. So whatever brands, whatever data people are using, that's just a very, very quick hack to do that. 
We actually do the, that exact same thing because suppliers on our platform, we're sitting in India, Pakistan, they have no idea what's selling over here, but they need to curate that out of all the donations that are coming in. So that's the hack that we provide this information to them again and again, and that's how our team goes and sources what's going on. Other things is just like following like what's happening in like culture overall. Like, you know, if Kendall Jenner wears something, that's probably gonna blow up and people will want that. I like we have like a brown nupsy that was just like you know, massively trending a while ago. So it really sort of depends on what's happening in culture as well. That'll then lead to something going massively up. Thanks guys. Do you want to speak, Kev? Uh, yeah, well, I was just going to, I think it, because um, there's a lot of people obviously that niche into certain things and people that pick up all kinds of different things and I'm, I'm the second, so I, there's not much that I won't pick up, but I think a lot of it for me comes from research and putting that time in, even at the time as well. Like I was saying to someone earlier actually, in terms of when I pick something up, I almost put myself in your shoes, I think. I'm going to research it. Even if I think I've got an inkling of what it might be, I'll still be looking at the salt, I'll still be, you know, finding out what that item is, because obviously George is saying the trends change and there'll be certain prices, so if you try and remember too much almost, you, you might be a bit wrong. And if you, if anyone follows me on Instagram, they're probably aware that I don't like spending a lot of money on things. So I'm, I'm pretty tight with my money, so if something is like edging towards four or five quid, I don't want to be spending four or five quid until I know that it's actually worth a lot of value. So I'd say just take that time to really put in the research at any opportunity you can. Like Google Lens, for example, is you know, just such an amazing tool. You can literally be standing in a shop, take a picture of it, walk around the shop, like, try and find signal, and then do Google Lens. You can instantly know what that product is. The, the kind of the tools are out there. So yeah, use the uh, the tools available as well. As, as I have a question for you guys. Do you guys often use um, the, the sold feature on eBay, like Google search for sold listings? So that's another way that you can try to find what you were just saying as well. Like, if you find something, just go search for it, like sold eBay and see how much it's sold for. And that'll give you a good idea of like what your returns might be. Yeah. And just to add to that as well, like one thing that really changed me for that, which wasn't, probably was quite a long time ago, but it doesn't feel like a long time ago, was that you can lock certain searches, I don't know, if, everyone would be aware of that but when you're searching on eBay so for example I tend to lock it to used because I pick up used items you can lock it to UK lock it to sold so when you search it would only bring up sold used items in the UK and then you sort it from high to low or however you want to do it you know previous to that you know, search clicking use clicking sell so you know, then the tools available if you, if you kind of fine tune them right and use them effectively they will really really help Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. We've got a question from uh, Alex. Introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Alex. <laughs> um, I have two questions, if that's all right. There's one generally for everyone, one specifically for Fleet. Um, how, so the general question is just how how has how your source stock changed over since like the past sort of three, four, five years? Do you find that you source more online than some other platforms, or are you sort of out there? Looking at stuff more and just how generally is that changing everyone. Um, and the question for the week was just what, obviously, you talk about your supply chain and um, your network of suppliers. Um, I'm just wondering how you sort of vet the sort of, um, you know, the sort of modern slavery aspect of that and um, making sure people are getting paid the right way and things like that. I can um, answer your second question first. So, most of our suppliers are based out of Pakistan and India. About 80% of our supply, about 75% of our supply comes from Pakistan. About 15% or so comes from India, and the rest is from places in the UK, US, Italy, Thailand, etc. Now, I'm personally, I was born and brought up in India. And the two kinds of suppliers we have. One are these large, rag houses or so that are mostly in export processing zones in these countries. Now, export processing zones are essentially very, very highly regulated areas that are tax-free, that allow people to import items, sort them out, and then export it. So there's extremely high regulations and very high level of audits that are done for these sort of factories or rag houses or these textile recycling units that are there. That makes up about 50% of supply on our platform today. So for those folks, there's just the highest level of um, audits that are done, and just as a function of them being in these uh, 
areas. The second part of it, the rest of the 50% of the, um, the, the supply on our market is from the local markets. Now, the local markets in India and Pakistan specifically, there's a huge used clothing market because these are developing countries and people need these items because of the low cost aspect of it. So these folks are usually solo entrepreneurs. They own small retail shops. So essentially, they are resellers themselves. So what we're doing is they never really had the platform to come online and sell to a Western audience before. Items that they can now sell for, let's say, $5 a piece or five you know, pounds a piece, they used to first sell locally in the markets for like you know, 10 cents a piece. So there's a lot of upward mobility that is being provided to folks in these developing countries because of what we've built. Now, we also have an on-the-ground team. In, so we have about a 30-person team in Karachi, and we also have a team in Bangalore in India. And we verify suppliers before they come onto the platform to sell. So that's the way that we are making sure that you know, each person is verified to do so. And just because these folks are from those countries automatically doesn't relate to there being like a lax labor laws. Um, personally, being from India, so. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you remind me what the question was? <laughs> how do you sell us? How is uh, it was just. How is how you saw your stock change like from I don't know how long you've all been reselling books compared to like five, four, three years ago? Do you source more sort of taking from one platform to this on another, or do you find yourself still spending your time sort of bowing about looking at things? Um, certainly for me, and I think probably most guys have been doing it for a long time. I guess it, I started part time and kind of built things up, so it was a it was an auction thing for me when I started. I used to buy things at auction, sell them over seven days on a, when eBay was a auction type site um, and then repeat that process because I had a full time job so that was what I did but yeah as time goes on and obviously you need to you know, maximise your sourcing and, and your, your margins and things like that you obviously look for the different ways to source but I think it's so broad the angles to come out you know for example you know sitting next to Fika that's not something I have even you know slightly done before and, and still run a reselling business the same as other people it may be their, their soul kind of thing. So it is, um, there are so many angles and I think it's probably, you will find your own way, I'd say probably. It's quite a personal thing maybe in terms of how you source, because again, I think it's got to be something, like you're saying, like your passion. So for me, quantity selling and wholesale is something that I don't think would give me as much of a buzz as finding that one singular item that I can you know, make a, a big margin on. So kind of, um, yeah, maybe a, a bit of a personal thing. But in terms of platforms, yeah, it's, you know, all the platforms that are coming out now recently with, with Vinted and, and whatnot, things like that, you know, it's something that I think you do need to, you know, make the most of those opportunities as well, definitely. Yeah, so, so mine has, and I think, again, I, I, like probably a lot of people, I started out, I had a full-time job, and then I was just, Part time, so I used to maybe do all my work on like a Saturday or Sunday on, on the reselling side, um, and I actually started by importing from like I used to smell like jewelry and stuff, and I used to get it from like AliExpress, like kind of Chinese sites, import it in, and like then that was how that was like one of my main things because I could order online, get it delivered, take different, better, probably not better, but you know, photos, and then that was that was my thing, and then I added in charity shops, I came, like started going on Instagram, and you know, learned in charity shops, car boot sales, so then I added them in, and then now that I'm full time, I just, I, I just keep adding things in, and I'm just trying to see what works, obviously at the moment, like there's a lot of people talk a lot about like kind of going online to source, um, there's like wholesalers, um, I, I do like I, I like the wholesale method. I like processing the stuff. I'm not really a treasure hunter, um, which I think a lot of people are. I just like the processing. So actually, my dream is just to have stuff delivered, and I process it and then I sell it. Like I like the selling rather than the finding. Um, so yeah, I just like adding things in. Weird. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Um, and yeah, like having Fleek here again, like I've, again, I've heard of them, but um, I've never explored the avenue. So yeah, that's it's cool. Yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. 
I'm the complete opposite. I like the hunt. Um, I think compared to five years ago, um, things take me a lot less time because over the sort of five years, I've realised what I like to sell, what I'm set up to sell. Like, I love looking at little widgets and nice bits of ornaments and pottery and glass. I think it's beautiful. However, I don't have the setup to photograph it, I don't have the table, I cannot be bothered to pack it. And so now I've learned that actually stuff like that doesn't work for me because I don't have time, I don't have time. I, I, I do this part time. I haven't got time to process it. Um, I also know what I'm looking for. I know that I like to sell dresses because I know dresses of a certain size because I know that they sell very quickly for me. In my second shop, I sell sewing machines and overlockers and things like that. And I know that people, when the sewing bees are entry-level sewing machines, list them all because they just fly out. But actually, lots of people like to sell. Lots of people, they buy an entry-level and they'll go up to the five grand embroidery machine. So I look for those, I list and sell those in the second store. Um, I think it's about knowing what sells for you, knowing your market, knowing, I hate the word, but knowing your niche. <laughs> and sort of, then I don't spend a lot of time looking for opportunity and looking because it just saves me a lot of time knowing what sells in the categories that I sell in. I think my mind, like, hasn't changed much, but like, I like to explore like the international markets, like Japan. Uh, I'll randomly find myself on like Brazilian eBay like, for no reason at all. <laughs> and like, I'll just see what's sold for me recently and see how cheap you can get on out there. Like, it's just me, like, just Czech Republic eBay and that. <laughs> but yeah, other than that, Vinted, buy a lot on Vinted and put on Amazon. So, yeah, that's pretty much mine. You think about it. How I sell determines how I source. So starting when I first started eBay, I didn't need anything else but boot sales, charity shops. Then cross-listing came along, D, uh, Depop, Vinted, then I needed elsewhere. So I'd be going to like get wholesale a bit more. But now Whatnot's coming along. This time last year, Whatnot didn't exist. I'm buying on Whatnot every night I get told off for it. <laughs> Touching me. Um, yes, yeah, so there's always, something adapting, like how I'm selling now was different to a year ago, it was different to the year before that, it'll probably be different this time next year, there's probably another platform, a different way. So, yes, yeah, when there is a new platform, don't be scared to jump on it, so I know you're on what up, I bought from you, I know, you bought from me, dirt cheap, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just never be scared to adapt and just, yeah, go with it. Okay, we've got a question from Connor. Introduce yourself properly because Alex didn't. Um, <laughs> let us know your name, where you're from, and I do believe that you sell on whatnot, don't you? So, intro. Yeah, my name's Connor. Uh, BZ or clothing on whatnot. Jeez! Um, from Golden. Um, the question is at what point did you guys know it was time to go full time? When my wife said I need to get a job again. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in a job I hated. I was still living with my parents, and they were like, you've got to find something, because you're miserable. Which, to be fair, I was. Um, and I was just like, I was watching, you know, Nick Hills, I saw his thing pop up. I went to a car boot, and I was like, let's sit up and do this, you know, let's buy a load of crap. Spent like 30 quid, like I said earlier, I got that bucket of soldiers, they sold, my life was changed. I was there every week, I was searching on eBay, trying to find like the misspelled stuff stuff missing, um, keywords and all that. And then just from there, it just grew and I was like, I'm just gonna give it a go. It's been eight years, I'm doing all right. There's someone in here who knows my boss, so I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, it, w it was a pandemic. So I, I always said to myself, the reason I didn't go full time was because I liked having colleagues. And then when the pandemic hit, we were all made to work from home. So I was still working and I was working by myself in my little cabin where all my eBay stock was, but I was working for someone else. And at the time I had a two year old and my company carried on as normal. So there was no furlough. So I was expected to work. My husband was a key worker. Um, so I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? I can't work and look after a two year old. 
And then it just got to the point where I was like, I'm sat here with my eBay stock, so I just, that it was that. And if anyone was selling during the pandemic, like it, it went through the roof because no one could go to the shops. So it was kind of perfect for me. Um, yeah, similar vibe, I guess, you know, kind of picked up a few things years ago. I remember picking up a jigsaw for a pound and it sold for £135. And it was a bit of a spark to think like, wow, surely this is you know, scalable kind of thing. So it grew. I did do proper work, if you like, maybe 10 years ago where it was, you know, leaving the house at seven in the morning, getting in at six. And I was, I was passionate about it at the time, but, you know, when you start to realise that actually, you know, so much of your time is spent out of the house, you know, I've got a young family, you kind of look for other avenues, I suppose, and then when you find things like self-employment, you can make up your own hours. And I think providing you've, you've done the maths of what you're doing, and not, I mean, I've jumped in a couple of your whatnot shows, I'm very much a watcher. Sorry, guys, no buy a great deal at the moment. But I've, I've seen your shows, you know, and I suppose you, you've got to work out, I guess, for yourself to think, you know, how's it going? How many hours am I putting into this? Doing the maths. I would say, you know, it's very important to know that you're going to be comfortable with it. And, you know, comfortable for you will be comfortable, uh, different comfortable with somebody else. And it's all about knowing what's going to work for you and your, your kind of life set up at the time. And just, yeah, give it, give it some time first. I, I would never... I'd recommend people to jump in, you know, they have a week of great sales and think, well, that's brilliant. Like, you know, give it some time, which is why it is, you know, you can probably tell I quite like reselling, but like, it is such a, the, the perfect thing to do on the side and kind of test the water because it is as much time as you give it, you know, you, once you've got your kind of magical figure that you believe you can make per hour, say, you know that, you know, the more hours you put in, the more you'll be getting back. And certainly for something like whatnot, I'm sure you've got, you know, a pretty kind of average, um, you know, show kind of bringing in now, things like that. So, yeah, it's about making sure that you're comfortable with what it would be right for you, I would say, going through. I'm going to speak more sort of generally about this, but I'm just echoing what you were saying. There, think of it as an opportunity cost. If you're putting X amount of hours into this, what are you getting out of it? If you could put X hours into something else, what would you get out of it? As soon as reselling starts getting you more, don't switch yet. <laughs> Wait and see how repeatable that's gonna be. All right, give it a quarter. Give it like three months. See what that's like. And then at the same time, don't just depend on other marketplaces because you never know when an algorithm change is gonna completely <laughs> screw you over. So start building your own channels. Be that opening up your own Shopify store, opening you know, Instagram, TikTok, just start building your own community. Because it comes down to you know, using a rented community versus owning your own community. Like, so that would be my recommendation at least. I don't know what you guys, because you guys also have your own communities quite a bit, so. Thanks, Arby. Okay, we have one question here, and then we will take it to the back of the room, because I'm sure there's lots. Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, yeah, my name's Simon. Um, so my question is, do you think about the future? Do you think about kind of like how you're gonna scale your business? Um, where do you think you're gonna be in five years time? Um, yeah, me personally, obviously do think about the future. You've got no, no choice, obviously, certainly with a family. You know, you want, to, you want to know that the future is going to be comfortable. In terms of, um, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who sees this as a reach for the stars kind of thing. Like, you know, as Lola was saying earlier, you know, it's that, that cake and your ingredients in it. You know, mine is very much about living a life that is comfortable for our family. And actually, that almost I feel like I don't work sometimes. Like, I, I see this as something that almost isn't job-like because I enjoy it so much. And that's what I really appreciate. I think if I was to scale it to a size where I'm getting up in the morning because I've got to do orders and I've got to get to the warehouse, things like that. You know, for me at the moment, that's not somewhere I would see like where I want it to go. But uh, like we say, everybody is, is completely different and what your kind of motivation is for things is, is going to be uh, it's going to be different as well. So for me personally, where I am, hence going full time late last year, I was at a position where I knew it's suiting the lifestyle I've got. Um, and at the moment, for me personally, when I've got four little children at home, you know, time is a premium anyway. So, you know, in 10 years' time, maybe, when children are growing, it's, it's something that probably I would, I would like to explore in terms of pushing it and 
given those hours back into the business. But yeah, at the moment, I think it's just finding that nice balance to where you want to be at. Um, that's the end of our first question.